Hello YouTube, this is Captain Ball here and I have a beautiful rifle from you from Sweden. This is an 1851 Kammerlader rifle. This is one of the very early breech holding rifles of the 19th century and we love everything that is made of wood and metal and comes from Sweden. If we talk about percussion breech loading rifles, we often think that they appeared in the American Civil War and we think about rifles like the Sharps, like the Gallagher, like the Burnside or the Smiths. But in fact, in the 1840s, they were already serving in Europe. This is the story of the Nordic Kamerlade rifle, which started its history in Norway. But before we go on, let me thank you for your support. Your donations through Patreon or by buying or catting more products like the authentic American Civil War percussion revolver cartridge boxes or percussion revolver cartridge formers or our US Arsenal stadias or rangefinders or our uh, powder measure kits or our rubber printing plates for Arsenal cartridge bundles or our authentic flintlock tools, they all help to keep the quality of our channel high. Without you, this would be much, much harder. So thank you very much again. The Norwegian king, Karl John XIV, formerly known as Jean Bernadotte, Napoleon's famous marshal, decided to establish a committee in 1837 to look for the best infantry arm available. This little group of experienced officers examined all the possibilities and they decided to go for a breech loading system. They checked most of the breech loading systems, but they found none of them satisfactory. So they decided to go for a completely new design. The goal was to find the good balance between the fast rate of fire of the smoothbore muskets and the accuracy of the rifles. It was Captain Friedrich Wilhelm Scheel and Niels Gregersen who invented the design we call today the Kammerlader system or the chamber loading system. The first Kammerlader rifle was adopted by the Norwegian army in 1842. The first cartridge it used, it was holding a round ball, but later in 1849, the cartridge was also loaded with a conical ball. I decided to start experimenting with lighter charges. So first, I went for 60 grains of 2F Swiss powder as a trial. The projectile is an early conical ball, the Spitzkugel. The lubrication of the cartridge is pure tallow.
greatest challenge of the early breech holders was how to seal the joint between the barrel and the breech. We don't have a cartridge case here, and in modern firearms it is the brass cartridge case that is responsible for sealing the breech. The Nordic Kammerlade rifle used the well-known system. Loading a chamber and inserting it into the breech was not an invention of the 19th century. Although the rifle was inspired by the whole flintlock breech loading rifle, we all know that this system already existed in the Middle Ages. Actually, the first breech loading or chamber loading systems appeared in the 15th century. We can find many artillery pieces in the armory of Maximilian I, Emperor Maximilian I. These items were very simple. They had a completely independent breech piece that, when fired, it can be removed and replaced by a loaded one. An iron frame was holding together the breech piece and the barrel. This simple system was often used in forts, for example, or on ships, where they lacked the space for loading a muzzle loading weapon. If you look closely at the images of Maximilian's armaments, you can see that the way the barrel and the breech was locked together is nearly the same as it is used on the Kammerlader systems. And we also know that in the 16th century there are many rifles or there are many guns, handheld firearms, that were using the chamber loading system. So this system was anything but new in the 19th century. These seals are of course never perfect, but the Kammerlader system using this old method solved this problem perfectly. Even the flesh of the nipple, or the flesh of the cap, is hidden from the eye of the soldier, because the percussion cap and the nipple are hidden on the underside of the rifle. This also solved another problem, or this is another benefit, because there is no hammer and there is no nipple obstructing the view of the soldier, so the view of field is much larger. Quite comfortable rifle, by the way. This is my second trial with 72 grains of 2F Swiss powder. The projectile and the lubrication is the same as last time.
and this is 72 grains with the Spitzkugel bullet, ladies and gentlemen, at 50 meter. I have three shots in the size of the 10 ring and one, let's say, in the 9 ring group and one in the 8 ring group, which means that the rifle starts to group. This is a good starting point for later load development, but I will have to get rid of the cartridge concept and probably I will load the rifle next time with loose powder, corn wet and the bullet to, to uh, just to raise the bullet in flush with the mouth of the chamber so it immediately impacts the 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 forcing cone and the and the rifling less deformation that's free flying period which means more accurate shot but uh, that must be done without the cartridge casing without the paper cartridge casing but it's a great one to shoot this rifle that's an important part of firearms history i love it let's talk about the history of the swedish rifle Sweden and Norway were united under the reign of the same king from 1814. It was a war that unified the two countries, and although it was Sweden who won the war, the introduction of the Kammerlader system came quite late in Sweden, only in 1851. It was Lieutenant August von Feilitzen that designed the Swedish version of the Norwegian Kammerlader in 1851, and the Navy adopted the rifle in 1851. There are not too many differences between the two rifles. Probably the most distinctive difference is the hammer itself, which has a circular opening on the Swedish rifle. And also, instead of, a, let's say, a second trigger guard protecting the hammer, we have only a shield here, a 4cm shield here, that is protecting the hammer. It is interesting that the rifle does not have a half cock, but you have two or rather three brass buttons here that can hold a little leather tab that will prevent the hammer from falling on the nipple and it will protect it so it is actually acting like a safety. The barrel of this rifle is 71.2 centimeters long and it is of course rifled. The sides of the rifle are set to be regulated to 400, 600, 800 and 1000 feet but it is interesting that the rear sight has only two positions, which means that the front sight must have been used for adjusting the rifle to the proper distance, so actually you had to use fine sight, full sight or normal sight for aiming. The caliber of the rifle is 14.85 mm, and the length of the twist, it has a six groove, right-handed groove, and the twist rate of the rifle is 213 mm. The diameter of the chamber is a bit larger, it is 16.3 mm, which means that you actually need the paper to be able to tightly fit the bullet into the chamber and to have it completely aligned with the axis of the bore. The stock of the rifle is made of beershwood and it is stained brown. It has a beautifully carved cheek piece here. And the rifle itself is quite heavy. It is around 5.3 kg, so this is a robust rifle. The original cartridge held 5.3 grams of black powder and also a 24 gram bullet. It was a conical bullet. The length of the bullet was around 22.27 millimeters and the diameter of this bullet was 15.2 millimeters. It was wrapped in a paper casing, a paper cartridge, and the end of this paper cartridge had to be beaten off before charging the powder in the chamber and then ramming the bullet with the paper wedding into the chamber, then capping the rifle, closing the breech, firing the rifle, and it uh, said to have a muzzle velocity of 1180 meters per second, uh, feet, feet per second, I'm sorry, that is around 350 meters per second. Well, my cartridge is not the exact copy of the original, but I happen to have a bullet mold that completely fits my rifle. It is not the original shape bullet, not the Swedish bullet, but it's a contemporary design. It's a Spitzkugel bullet. Well, I slugged my board to measure exactly the diameter between the grooves and between the lines. Well, the exact diameter of my bore is 14.76 millimeters between the lens and 15.40 between the grooves. The process starts with rolling the cartridge case. Now choke the cartridge case on the bullet. Tie it with a string. Fill the powder in the cartridge. And fold the tail of the cartridge the traditional way.
Now dip the bullet end into molten tallow. My cartridge design is the Norwegian design because I don't exactly know how the Swedish cartridge was rolled. But if you want to know more about the modern time shooting of these rifles, then I strongly suggest you to check the webpage and the YouTube channel of Oivin Flatness. He's from Norway. He's an excellent history buff and also he's a black powder shooter, just like me. And he has beautiful content about the chamber loading rifles. He also wrote two books. One is especially about the chamber loading rifles. Check that out. It's a beautiful read. Now, what are the benefits of using a breech loader instead of a muzzle loader? First of all, the rate of fire increased dramatically, about double compared to the muzzle loaders. Second, the breech loading rifle can be loaded in any position, so behind the cover, laying down on the ground, or kneeling, sitting, any position will go. Third, the breech loaders ease the wide acceptance of the rifle bores for all the armies. How? By the early 40s, all the military rifles were loaded with patch round balls. Nearly all the military rifles were loaded with patch round balls. The patch itself is creating the contact, the physical contact between the undersized ball and the bore itself. And it is slowing down the process. But if you get rid of the patch, then you will lose the accuracy. Well, the breech loaders have a solution here. You don't need a patch because you can insert an oversized bullet into the breech. It will fill the grooves. The rifling will spin the bullet and you will have accuracy and you will have a good rate of fire. Let's check how many shots I can fire in one minute. That was the 50 meter ordinary Swedish rifle time with the 1851 Swedish Kammerlader. Well, <clears throat> not the fastest thing on earth because of the percussion cap that you have to manage, but otherwise a perfect rifle, excellent rifle. The rifle itself is robust and reliable, it seems reliable, but it has some weak points. For example, the stock on the sides of the receiver is very thin, so you can often find a crack here. My rifle has the crack as well, but uh, if you see one camera ladder with the crack, don't worry about it because it won't cause any problem, it can easily be repaired. Another good feature of this rifle, that field stripping is very easy, because you can disassemble the gun without using any tools. Let me show you how to do it. First you have to remove the barrel bands. They are held in place by strings, so it's quite easy. The barrel breech is hooked, so you can easily remove it. And voila, there you have the barrel for cleaning. Let's see what happens with the breech piece. It can also be disassembled without using tools. So there's a little pin on the side of the receiver that has to be moved backwards, like this. And then you can just remove the axis of the chamber piece and then you can remove the chamber. You can see here that the cam itself is actually eccentric, which means that when I'm moving this lever up and down, it is forcing the chamber forward to completely lock the joint between the breech and the barrel. Clever, isn't it? The locking method of the breech piece is quite safe and quite ingenious. It is actually locking at two places. First, the mouth of the chamber is locked into the 
bridge, the barrel bridge. You can see that how it is done. Second, there's a lug in the inside of the receiver that is locking into this little recess on the bridge piece. The lever itself has a safety catch against opening accidentally, so you can actually have to pull this little button upwards to be able to open the lever and to open the action. If you are looking for more information about how this action works, then I suggest you to visit Block on the Range YouTube channel, because he has an excellent video about the Swedish Kammerlader as well, and he just created a see-through version of the frame itself that lets you completely watch how the action is locking into the bridge and how this little lug is working. It's excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, 50 meters, 6 shots, and I will have to say that we have a charge here. That rifle is accurate. 1851 Kammerlader from Sweden. So the Swedish Navy adopted the rifle in 1851. My rifle has the Navy acceptance marks also on the stock. In Hungary we have a special event for these rifles, so we can use it for competition. We call it the Berdan event. It's a 13-shot, 50-meter offhand shooting event. The target is the standard ISSF pistol target, 50-meter pistol target. And after the 13 shots, 10 counts. We had this event on the 2016 World Championship and the European Championship of 2019 as an experimental event as well. Our Swedish friends have their individual match also for this rifle, which they call the Navy Boy. It's a 50-meter shooting event. And uh, it's not offhand, but you can support the rifle on a rope, like as you were doing it on a ship. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. If you like what I do, then please like, share, comment, subscribe. If you wish to support me, you can do it through Patreon. Or you can also buy the Cap and Well products, they are both great help for us. Both links are in the description of the video. So ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.